called the light day and the darkness he called night. There was evening and morning the first day. You start to see a pattern. God uses patterns. If you can start to see this, this isn't just a, a, a creation story. This was revealing things to me about the God that I serve. And you continue to see this as he creates. Let's go down through here. I want you to see this, and we'll, we'll try to wrap it up with this. I will also say... Um, uh, I'm doing good. Okay. If you have questions about anything that I say, or are concerned, or you feel like I've misspoken, because um, I'm certainly not... Uh, ordained by this conference, or if you think that there's anything off in what I'm saying, or if you have a background in science, or you've read something that you have a question about, write that down and give it to me. Find me afterwards or sometime today. I will do my best, my very best, to answer those questions or to find the answers that you have. But I don't have time really in this forum to take questions um, from the floor. So if you have a question about something that I've said or something that you've wondered about, about any of this, the science part or the the philosophy part, the logic part, um, please write that down and get it to me. I'd love to answer those questions. Let's keep moving. I'm not going to go through every day. You know the days of creation, but I would encourage you to read them again. And I want you to see it this way. And God said, uh, I don't know if I can do this. Um, thank you. You can, you can sit down. We didn't get all the way through, but that's okay. You get the idea, right? You see how rich this is? This isn't just my idea is this is in God's word. God said, let the land produce vegetation. God said, let there be lights. In the vault of the sky to separate, he goes down, he's bringing order. He's using patterns. He's using day and night, evening and morning, which by the way, if you're a theistic evolution, I'm not sure where the evening is in the first million years. Let's work on that one. Uh, not sure where the morning is. They had language for big pieces of time. They don't need to use day and night, evening and morning, if they weren't talking about 24-hour day. That's my opinion. That's my interpretation of this word. I don't feel like we have to get to, you have to do a lot of biblical calisthenics to get to an old earth. We don't need it. I don't think we need to do it. And I'm going to show you a little bit about why I think that's important. Let there be lights. Let the water team with living creatures. Let this happen. Let this happen. God created. Uh, we get down here, verse 24, God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock. By the way, that's another one, according to their kinds, according to their species. We never see in science a jump from species, one species to another. We see variety. Um, in fact, I just recently learned that in the science class, you learn kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species that they're adding one now called variety because we see so much variety. We see so much variety genetically in spe within species. What we don't see is a jump from one species to another. And that's what Darwin was looking at. He was looking at incredible variety in his finches and all the other animals that he studied on the Galapagos 150 years ago. He didn't have information theory. He didn't have DNA. Um, we don't see change from one species to another. We see incredible variety, which to me points to the creativity of an of a amazing God. So he gets down to verse, finishes verse 25. He's kind of had this rhythm going, God made, God said, God let, God, um, let these things happen, and they happen by his word. Verse 26, then God said, and you see this kind of transition into something a little different. And you can see it right here. Let us make mankind in our image. This is something different. And if, I, if I'm looking to add evolution to my theory, I take away some of this. Because... It's not different than the animals. It's a natural progression from animals to man, if I'm latching on to the evolution theory. But God did something different. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. The message says reflecting our nature. What is God's nature just based on this word right there? Relationship. 
said, that's speaking of the Trinity, right? Let us, God said, singular, let us, plural, before he created anything, God was in relationship with himself. God's nature is relationship. What I learned from this that we could add down there is God is in relationship. God loves. God is love. God is uh, relational. He's a relational God. So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures of the ground. He says it again. It's the first time he's repeated something. So God created mankind in his own image. What else does that mean? Just other than relationship. Okay, we're in his image. What does it say about my image then? Or about we have these things, right? And maybe you can't see them. From the point we're created, we believe we are eternal beings, right? That we live forever. Our soul, our spirit lives forever. We are creative. God made us creatively. We're reflecting his nature. Now, we're never going to be as creative as him. And without him, we'll be certainly a lot less creative. God is big. Not that big, but play is big. <laughs> But he delights in the small things. God's a mystery. My wife's a mystery. Okay? I mean, there's... God is good. He created us good. He created us to have dominion. He created us to rule this world. Just like reflecting his nature of his rule over his creation. Do you see how origin determines identity? If those things are in God, and I'm reflecting, I'm reflecting God, and I'm reflecting His nature, and part of my purpose on this earth is to reflect His nature, those are some things, those are some qualities that I'm going to begin, begin to see in my life that were, that were created pre-fall to be a part of who I am. And if you can imagine, when we look at Revelation, what heaven is going to be like is those things in us without sin without death, without decay, without crying, without pain. I'm jumping ahead, I can't get too far ahead. This determines, this should determine some of just knowing that this is where I came from, just like because I came from Ohio, I'm a Buckeye, I've got to be that. And, you know, I'm stuck there. Yeah, thank you, right? God's country. Determines some things about me. Knowing that I came from God determines some things about me. And my job as a human being on this earth is to figure out how to be in a relationship with Him first, relationship with others second, and how to begin to live my life reflecting His nature. Isn't that what we're here for? And that's where the rest of the Bible helps me see how people did that and how people didn't do that. And what were the results of them making those choices. So I see example after example after example of here's how to do it, here's how not to do it, here's how to do it, here's how not to do it. Here's what happens when you run this ma machine the way it was intended to run, and here's what happens when you do not run this machine the way it was intended to run. So God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and everything. God said, I give you everything on this earth. Take care of it. Cultivate it. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. I have five minutes. I am going to jump to Genesis chapter 2. And I want to start answering the second question. That is origin. That's just origin and identity. I want to look at the second question in the five minutes that I have left. Oh, there's so much I'm not getting to here. That's no 
we'll just have to wonder. <laughs> let, me, let me review this and then I'll move on. Biblical worldview says you came from God. You were made in His image, reflecting His nature. It took Him six 24-hour days. I'll debate that all day, and I've got an amazing thing I just heard. I don't know, I don't know if I have time. If you want to have that conversation, I'll show you something that's incredible. He has a plan for your life. He designed, his design and purpose for your life was very good. He designed you for relationship. Those are the things that we learn just in one chapter of the Bible. The first chapter. The naturalistic worldview says you came from, not sure. We don't have a good answer. We're still working on it. Big Bang Theory says you came from an accidental explosion, air compression, and then explosion of matter. They call it singularity. All the matter in the universe to a microscopic level. Evolution theory says it took 13 billion years to get to this point, give or take 200 to 300 million. They're not really sure, but that's the ballpark. <laughs> I shouldn't say it that way, that's really mean, but it is kind of funny to me. The, the process, survival of the fittest, genetic mutate, this is how we got here, according to evolution theory. Genetic mutation, trial and error, extinction, disease, and death. That's the other problem that I have with mixing what we wanted, what Hugh Ross wants to do, and a lot of other Christian university professors and teachers and Bible pastors, they want to borrow from this theory. My question is why? Why would you want to borrow this? First of all, God doesn't need it. I believe in a big God, and I have a small view of these things. Evolution has a very big view of mutation, death, extinction, sin, not sin. We, here's why it makes a difference in holiness, can't be. A lot of churches have a small view of God and a big view of sin. Genesis 1 helps me to have a big view of God and a small view of sin. Not that sin doesn't have influence in my life, but that the cross of Christ can do something about that. Amen. And that's why it matters. And every time we chop away at the bigness of God and say, maybe God needed millions of years or billions of years to get to good, we make God small. And every time we say, you know what? The Bible says it was evening and morning. And God took his time to make man. My question is, how do you, some people say, how do you do it in six days? I say, what took him so long? <laughs> uh, you know, if he can speak and stuff happens, he didn't need six days. He was establishing a pattern. That again tells me something about the nature of God. He was showing me something through that. He didn't need it. He certainly didn't need these things. I don't believe. You know what? We're gonna show you this because it's it's unbelievable, and then we'll end here. I'm not gonna get into the second question. That's Genesis two. I would say between tonight and tomorrow, read Genesis chapter two. We'll talk about Genesis two and all of Revelation tomorrow. Atheistic. I'm gonna read this and then we'll be done. I promise. And I, you said I could have five minutes of transition. Okay. Author tackles the question of theistic evolution or progressive creation as valid middle ground. This is the call of What is the crux of what a theist, and I consider myself to be a believer in God, to be so anathema to the concept of evolution or against? I don't see the inherent contradiction. He's saying, why can't I believe in God and believe in evolution? He's asking an atheist philosopher this question. Because a lot of times we think, well, if we add evolution to our theory, we're going to gain some friends in the evolutionary world, right? And that somehow brings us a little closer and gains some credibility with that group. Post, it's a good question. Dan, is there an inherent contradiction? And by the way, it's Daniel Dennett, a very outspoken, well-known atheist. Is there an inherent contradiction between adopting an evolution theory and being a theory? theist? You can certainly deny the concept of intelligent design without thinking that there is a real contradiction between being a theist and belief. So he rephrases the question. What do you think? Well, it all comes down to what you mean by a theist. To put it perhaps a little bit rudely, what kind of a job description do you have for God? 
This is that idea of a big, do we have a big God or a little God? What kind of God do you want to follow and worship? This is an atheist saying this. Do you think that God is creating individual species and designing with foresight all the particular details as sort of a supernatural engineer, which I happen to believe, so he's describing me, then there is a real conflict. He's saying, if you believe in the God that this Bible talks about, there's a conflict between that and this theory. This atheist is saying, you, he's, he's not saying, yeah, come on board, let's see if we can you know, try to garner some of this Christian community support. He's saying, if you believe in this God, that's a supernatural designer, there's a real conflict in, in believing this theory. Keep watching. Because all the work that God would do is done by natural selection just fine. They have, according to him, they've got an explanation for that post. But you could have a fine tuner, which is where he Ross goes. There are so many universes possible. How did this one support life happen? God fine-tuned it, set the parameters of fundamental con constants so evolution would be a consequence of it. That's an argument that a lot of Christians are, are using to kind of wrap into the evolutionary world. Daniel Dennett, fine. That's the first fallback, that God is not so much the designer by retail, but he kind of set things in motion. He fine-tunes the contents of nature so that evolution can take over the job. However, we now have theories which say we don't even need God for that role. He doesn't have to be the lawgiver or the law finder. We now have string theory, which says all fine-tuning exists in some sense. By the way, if you want to blow your mind, start reading about string theory. I have, and it blew, blew my mind. In some sense, we just happen to live in one of the parts of the universe where we can live, where things are just tuned, tuned just right. So that task for God as fine-tuner is also in jeopardy, which leaves, really, only the sort of master of ceremonies. If that's all you mean by God as sort of a benign overseer who doesn't intervene and doesn't have to do anything, and he emphasized that, I was transcribing this from a caller, he emphasized that word, doesn't have to do anything, then of course you can go on being a theist. I don't believe in that type of a God that's just a benign overseer that doesn't do anything and isn't involved in my life. I believe in a God who delights in the small things and the insignificant and who sent his son and got involved in this earth and is with us. That's the kind of God I want to believe in. It's up to you. You're not left with a nice middle ground. It's either he's just a benign overseer and he doesn't, he's not involved in this life, or he, this guy's saying it's all or nothing. Can't pick and choose. Thank you. Thank you. Our real quick five minute break, and let's.